Here we have the classic question in which you have four charged particles arranged on the corners of a square and your job is to first determine the electric field at a particular location, in this case at the location of the charge marked Q, so right here. Now in order to help understand this question we're going to zoom in on the picture, so we're going to magnify it. And what we'll also do is set up a little chart. And you can see this chart contains several variables. We have charge, we have distance, electric field, an angle, and then here we're gonna have the X component of the electric field, and here will be our Y component. So we're gonna be filling in all columns of that chart. But before we do so, it is helpful to understand that because we're calculating the electric field strength at this location, we will understand that it is the other charges at the other corners of the square that will actually be contributing to the electric field at this location right here. So in other words, when you're trying to calculate the electric field at a particular location, any charge that is actually present at that location will not be contributing to the electric field at that location. So in essence, we can remove the charge that has been labeled Q and we will leave behind a Y and X axis. The next thing we want to do is draw in the electric field. So for example, let's consider the charge that is marked positive 2Q. What you always want to do when determining the direction of an electric field is imagine that you put a positive charge at the particular location of interest. Now that positive charge, which is known as a test charge, would be repelled by the positive charge marked 2Q. And because it would be repelled, it would be pushed away from that positive 2Q charge. So in other words, that hypothetical test charge would be pushed to the right, and that would be the direction for the electric field that is produced by the charge marked 2Q. Similarly, if we look down below at the charge marked 4Q, which is also positive, that charge would also repel this positive hypothetical test charge. So in that case, you would get a force pushing up on the test charge, and therefore we can mark that as E4Q. As for the 3Q charge, that is also positive, so it's also going to repel the hypothetical test charge. In this case, that's going to be pushing the test charge diagonally in this direction here. We can mark that E3Q. So it's always important to draw in your electric fields before you start filling in this chart right here. Now, to the chart we will go, and the first thing we're going to do is just fill in all of the charges. So we'll go with the 2Q, followed by the 4Q, and then the 3Q. The next column of the chart is marked R, and that is simply the distance from each charge to the location of interest. So for example, the distance from 2Q to that location is A. So we're just going to fill in A into our column. The distance from 4Q to that location is also A. The distance from 3Q to this location is a little trickier to understand. It's gonna be this distance right here that was supposed to be a straight line. You'll notice that we actually form a right triangle right here, that, which we've outlined here. We have a right angle right there. You might know from a geometry class that when you have a right triangle and two of the sides are identical, so they're both marked A, then the hypotenuse of that right triangle is actually A radical two. That can be very easily proved using Pythagorean theorem. But for now, we will take it for granted that that distance is indeed A radical two. Next, we have to fill in the electric field strengths. And to do that, we're going to be using the electric field equation. This is the equation that gives us the electric field produced by point charges, which is what we have. So for example, we're going to start out and calculate the electric field of the charge marked 2Q. We can see that to do that, we take a constant, Ke, multiply that by the amount of charge, which in this case is 2Q. Now you're gonna multiply by 2Q. It's probably tidier to put the Q here and the two there and then divide that by the distance squared. Now this distance is A, so you're gonna divide that by A squared. Nice and easy. Onto the second electric field, the one contributed by 4Q, same idea, you'll take the constant Ke, multiply it by the charge, which is 4Q, and again, we'll be tidy, so we'll put the Q here and the four there, and then divide it by the distance squared, so it'll be A squared. And then finally, to the third electric field, it will be the constant Ke, multiplied by a charge of 3Q, and then divided by the distance squared. Now this distance is A radical two, but we're gonna have to square that. Why don't we just simplify that right off the bat? So A radical two squared would be A radical two times A radical two. Of course, A times A is A squared. Radical two times radical two is radical four, which is two. So it ends up being two A squared. So we can actually clean this up a little bit and just change this to two A squared. 
The next column has an angle marked, and we need to be careful with our angles. When you measure your angles, please make sure that you measure them relative to the positive x-axis. I'll show you what, you what we mean by that in just a moment. So relative to the positive x-axis. For example, look at the electric field E2Q uh, pointing directly to the right. Now that is pointing directly along the positive x-axis. So that angle would actually just be zero degrees. Now take a look at E4Q. E4Q is being measured, again, from the positive x-axis. So you would want that angle right there. That angle, of course, is 90 degrees. And then finally, take a look at E3Q. That is going off in a diagonal direction. We probably understand that in a square, a diagonal cuts the 90 degree angle in half. So this angle right here would be 45 degrees. And hence, this angle right here also would be 45 degrees. So that's what we'll fill in here. Now, for the x component, we're going to take the electric field and multiply it by the cosine of the angle. So for example, you're going to take this electric field and multiply it by the cosine of this angle. Now, perhaps we all know that the cosine of zero degrees is just one. So in essence, when we take the electric field and multiply it by the cosine of theta, in this case, you're gonna end up with the same result. It's gonna be two keq over a squared. On the other hand, for the y component, you take the electric field, multiply by the sine of the angle. The angle is zero degrees and the sine of zero is actually zero. So in essence, you're gonna have a y component of zero. And that kind of makes sense if you look back at the diagram because the electric field E2q was pointing to the right it's not at all pointing either up or down, so the y component would be zero. So hopefully that makes some sense. Moving on to the electric field produced by 4q, this time the angle is 90 degrees. So when we take the electric field and multiply it by the cosine of 90, you're gonna end up with zero here because the cosine of 90 is zero. And then for the y component, the sine of 90 is one, so you'll just have four k sub e times q over a squared. And then finally, onto the x and y components of this electric field. Now, it does turn out that the cosine of 45 degrees as well as the sine of 45 degrees are the same result, and they each equal radical two over two. So for the x component, you're gonna take the electric field, which was three keq over two a squared, and you're gonna be multiplying that by radical two over two. And that will also be true for the y component. So we're gonna get a little squeezed in here. Why don't we just understand that the Y component is going to be the same as the X component, again, because cosine and sine are equal. So we'll just put little quote marks there to indicate that. So we have the chart completely filled in. What do we do next? Well, we need the net electric field. So we're just gonna make an extra row here. We'll call this electric field net. And to get the net electric field, you're gonna need the total X component and also the total Y component. And that's gonna be pretty easy now that we have this chart filled in because the total X component will just be the sum of those three electric fields, which we will set up in just a moment. And then the total Y component will be the sum of those three electric fields, which we will set up. So why don't we come down below just because we don't have much room and we'll do it as follows. We'll say that the net electric field in the X direction is going to be the sum of the X components. So you'll have two k sub e q over a squared plus zero plus, now be careful here because you're gonna be multiplying the numerators right there. So you're actually gonna have three radical two, three radical two and then k sub e q over. And then if you multiply the denominators, you're gonna get four a squared. We'll clean that up in just a moment, but let's get the net electric field in the y direction. Same idea, you're gonna add the y components. So you take zero and you add that to four k sub e q over a squared. And then you're going to add, remember this y component right here was the same as the x component. So it's gonna be that three radical two k sub e q over four a squared. Okay, we are getting somewhere. We have the components all lined up. We probably just need to simplify them. Why don't we find a common denominator? So we can, for example, multiply this denominator by four and therefore also multiply the numerator by four. That's gonna change this to eight because four times two is eight. So change that to an eight and now you have a common denominator. So we can now add them together. These will be over four a squared. And let's see, you're gonna end up with a bit of a strange result. Hey, how about this? Because they both have KEQ in them, you can actually factor that out. 
So we can do K sub E Q. And then what would be left over is the eight plus three radical two. And now we'll do something similar for the Y component. Multiply this by four, multiply up here by four. You're gonna get a 16 up there in the numerator. So now if we factor out the KEQ again, you'll have 16 plus three radical two. Whoa, that's a weird three, isn't it? So three radical two over the common denominator of four A squared. So that's pretty good. Those are your X and Y components. If you'd like to, you can pick up a calculator and you can do eight plus three radical two divided by four. And that can get it in a simplified decimal answer. So let's do that. We'll do eight plus three radical two divided by four and you're gonna get 3.06. So let's make a little bit of room here for the X component. And we can see that it's going to turn out to be 3.06 K sub E times Q over A squared. And then similarly, pick up that calculator and take 16 plus three radical two and divide that by four. And let's see what we get when we do that. We're gonna get 5.06. So this will be 5.06 K sub E times Q over A squared. We have it, we can just write it in unit vector notation. So the net electric field for the X component was 3.06 K sub E Q over A squared. That will be I hat plus 5.06 a sub e times q over a squared times j hat. So in unit vector notation, there is your net electric field. Very exciting result. Finally, part a is done. We can go back up and recall that there was, unfortunately, a part b. And in part b, we just need the total electric force exerted on q. Okay, the total electric force. That shouldn't be too bad, actually, because the force acting on the charge Q will just be the electric field multiplied by the charge Q. So we're just gonna take the electric field that we just developed and we're going to essentially multiply it by Q. So it'll look something like this. It's gonna get a little messy, I guess, but we'll have force equals, why don't we paste that electric field in there? There it is. And then you're gonna multiply that by Q. If you'd like to, go ahead and distribute the Q into the parentheses. So you would have force equals 3.06 K sub E Q squared over A squared I hat plus 5.06 K sub E Q squared over A squared, and that will be J hat. That should be your force right there. So the question is complete. And if you'd like, you can shut the video off now. For those purists out there who notice that we could have simplified this just a little more, you're probably thinking, well, look, there is K, e, K sub E times Q over A squared, K sub E times Q over A squared. We could factor that out. Wouldn't that look nicer? I suppose it would. So for the electric field, if you'd like to, go ahead and factor it out. K sub E Q over A squared. I guess that would leave you with 3.06 I hat plus 5.06 J hat. And that does look neater, I will grant that. And you can do the same thing with the force, you can factor out the greatest common factor here, which is K sub E Q squared over A squared. So let's do it. K sub E Q squared over A squared multiplied by 3.06 I hat plus 5.06 J hat. And there is an alternative form for the force.